from the Hussman School of Journalism and Media at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, covering the full range of Tar Heel athletics. This is Sports Extra. We are two months into the school year and Carolina teams have lost only three games. Good morning and welcome to Sports Extra. I'm Charlie Costa. And I'm Caroline Ralph. Thanks for joining us. A pretty impressive start for most sports, but it's the football team that's looking for a comeback this week. It's Beat Duke Week, and the Tar Heels are traveling to Durham looking to take down those Devils. After arguably their worst game in program history against JMU, the Heels will kick off ACC play in Wallace Wade Stadium. Tomorrow's game will be the 111th matchup between the two Blues, with the Baby Blue holding a 66-40-4 to to upper hand in the series. The Heels have remained untouched by the Devils for their past five matchups, including last year's wild double overtime victory. With uncertainty about who will fill the Heels' starting quarterback position, restlessness in the locker room, and Duke still being undefeated, Carolina will have to show up better than ever to recover from last weekend's loss and bring the victory bell back to Chapel Hill. For more about the legion of things this team has to correct in a hurry, let's go to football analyst Bethany Pryor. Caroline, Saturday was a tough day for Tar Heel football. With five turnovers, 53 points in the first half, and the most points given up at Keenan Stadium in school history, the list just goes on and on. Let's take a look at some of the critical mistakes that UNC made on Saturday. In this play, it's a simple numbers game. There are one, two, three, four, five, six GMU players on one, two, three, four, five UNC players. Our long snapper, he's just gonna release into the backfield. We're gonna have our guard stay on his man as he's supposed to do. But our tackle, our tackle releases back into the deep field with his man because his man is ready for that deep ball. What he could have done is he could have stayed to help even the numbers. This is gonna leave three UNC players on one, two, three, four JMU players. That's gonna leave a man on the outside. He's gonna go around the block and get that punt blocked. Now, this makes a great play for JMU at the beginning of the game, a great touchdown, and it moves momentum quickly. Now, this is just one of the costly mistakes UNC made at this game. Let's take a look at another. Now, it's one minute before halftime. The heels are down 46 to 21. There's a lot of pressure. They want to get score before halftime to get some momentum going into the locker room, so the pressure is on. UNC has four wide receivers. There was one off the screen, and JMU is in man coverage with the safety in cover two formation over top. Now, Jacoby Criswell is not only going to feel pressure from the clock ticking down into halftime, but he's going to feel pressure from the defensive line on him. He left the pocket, and he just throws the ball away to Terrence Spence, and Spence takes it into the end zone as he's escorted by a lot of defenders, and he finds the way in for the score. Now, this play shows the energy and momentum that GMU had throughout the whole game. But there are some positives. The offense was able to put some points up on the scoreboard with Omarion Hampton's three rushing touchdowns and Jacoby Criswell throwing for three more. Jacoby Quis Criswell started for the first time and played great despite his two interceptions. He had 475 passing yards. Omarion Hampton had 139 rushing yards. And overall, offense played well with 50 points. But JMU scored on offense, defense, and special teams. They won all three phases of the game, leading to their 70-point victory in Keenan Stadium. Bethany, what can Carolina do tomorrow to keep the victory belt in Chapel Hill? Caroline, we have to limit the mistakes. We have to win the turnover battle, eliminate fumbles and interceptions on our side, and our defense needs to force Duke to make these critical mistakes. Let's hope that the Heels can turn things around and bring a sweet win home against the Blue Devils tomorrow. Thanks, Bethany. Fall has been flying by, and just like that, the Carolina women's basketball schedule is already set. The women fell last year to eventual champion South Carolina in the second round. All ACC guard Deja Kelly transferred to Oregon over the summer, but the heels return All ACC forward Alyssa Utsby, along with starters Lexi Donarski and Maria Gochting. Carolina begins the ACC slate at home against Georgia Tech on December 15th and takes on NC State at home on February 16th in their only regular season meeting. The Heels wrap up their season on the road at Duke. Being a competitive athlete at UNC is about more than just how well you play on the court. Emma Kane tells us it's also about who you are as a person. 
Sydney Barker started her freshman year as a walk-on onto the women's basketball team. Your freshman year is not easy. It's great that I walked into such a good community of people. Barker took advantage of all women's basketball has to offer and paid the same love her teammates gave her forward. And even if things like you're not playing or things are not going well for you, like it's still rewarding to like help them get better. I feel like such a cool experience when everybody wins versus like one person wins. Sydney quickly started to shine here at UNC. I remember I hit a shot and like everybody was just celebrating and I was like so excited my teammates were celebrating me. But to Sydney, basketball has always been about more than putting points on the board. It's about how you can impact your teammates and your team. So I feel like my faith, a big thing is like, I just feel like called to encourage others and like be a part of something bigger than myself. She's encouraging, dedicated, hardworking, supportive, and an irreplaceable teammate. So I'm just gonna do anything I can like to help the team, whether that's sitting on the bench with my mask and cheering or I need to go out on the court and play like that too. That's the goal to come in and like work hard every day and like be a part of the team even if I'm not on scholarship. But that soon changed. Barker was rewarded not only for her value as a player but also for her value as a teammate and in the spring of last year was awarded a scholarship position. Yeah I was so surprised like I can't even tell you because you dream about that your whole life. And then you get out there and you're like, I can't even believe like this is happening. They know that no longer is it a uh, walk on. <laughs> Barker is returning for her sophomore year and her new goal to help the freshmen feel the support she felt herself. I love like building relationships with any teammates, but especially the new ones. Like I love to make them feel comfortable and like help them in areas that I struggled with. I feel like as far as me, I just want to keep working hard, keep getting better at my skills, keep getting stronger, and just keep being like an active part of the team, like do my part to help us win, whatever that may be. I'm Emma Kane reporting. It truly takes a special person to be an athlete here at UNC. And seeing such a deserving athlete get rewarded for her hard work both on and off the court gives us a reason to cheer all the louder at this year's UNC women's basketball games. Now, speaking of basketball, it's going to be a big season for the men's team. For a look at what's ahead, let's go to half court with Haskell with basketball analyst Spencer Haskell. Spencer, what are you thinking? Caroline, it's funny. You know, it feels like we just got back to school. We're not even five weeks into football season, and we are already talking basketball, and I am pumped. I could not be more excited. I mean, I'm pretty excited, too. You know, we have a good roster coming back, led by none other than R.J. Davis. I mean, R.J. Davis was ACC Player of the Year, National Player of the Year contention. How do you think he's going to lead the Tar Heels this season? Yeah, I mean, it's no secret. R.J. Davis was the ACC Player of the Year last year. Clearly the best player in the conference, one of the best players in the country. It's his team this year. And the team will go as he does. Absolutely, it will. But it's not just R.J. Davis's team. We've got a slew of new Carolina people coming to UNC. Who are you excited to watch? Yeah, so I mean, it's you lose a couple key players like Harrison Ingram, Armando Baycott to the NBA, but you also bring back a couple key pieces like Elliot Cadeau, Seth Trimble, Jalen Washington. And not only that, you bring in a couple highly touted freshmen like Ian Jackson, Drake Powell, James Brown. And on top of that, you go in the transfer portal and you get a couple of the most sought-after transfers in the country like Kay Tyson and Ben Allen Lubin to lock up the front court. I mean, that what can be better than that? Our roster looks stacked, but so does our schedule. Spencer, what games are you excited to watch? Yeah, Caroline, it's, they play a stacked non-conference schedule. Home opener against Elon and straight from the jump. Second game of the season, they go to Lawrence, Kansas to play Kansas in Fog Allen Fieldhouse for the first time since 1960. And then on top of that, you've got UCLA in Madison Square Garden. You've got Florida and Charlotte for the Jumpman Invitational. And then obviously the game we all have circled on the calendar this year is Alabama coming to Chapel Hill for the ACC-SEC Challenge. And after March Madness last year, I know the Heels will have that one circled with a chip on their shoulder. Yeah, I'm excited to see that. I think playing such a tough non-conference schedule will bode well for the Heels, especially by the time March rolls around. Thanks, Spencer. The Carolina men's soccer team faces Cal tomorrow at Dorrance Field. This will be the first matchup between the teams in more than a decade. Cal has dropped three of its past five matchups, and if the Tar Heels play well, that trend could continue. UNC graduate forward Martin Vichian and senior forward Luke Hilly have been key contributors to Carolina's success this season, combining for 10 goals. Cal has struggled defensively, allowing eight goals this season, double what Carolina has given up with the Tar Heels claiming the second lowest goals against average in the league. UNC women's soccer returns to Chapel Hill tonight as the Heels host Virginia in a conference matchup.
The eighth ranked Tar Heels look to extend their win streak to five straight after a close 1 0 win against Syracuse last weekend. The Heels were awarded a penalty kick in the 66th minute after a long VAR review. Bella Sembert stepped up and converted it. The win marked Carolina's fourth straight shutout, and the Heels look to keep their lockdown defense rolling at Dorrance Field tonight at 7. Softball is back and has a big weekend ahead of them. The Heels are looking forward to fall ball after finishing their spring season with a 30 and 20 record. The Heels will take on NCANT, Gaston College, Coker and Brunswick this weekend. So look forward to lots of action at Anderson Stadium. Talent on the field is only half the story. Behind every great team is a support system of people who know how to coach, strategize, and inspire. Corey Davis shows us how one student manager is driving success from the sidelines. Anybody who knows me would not question my love for softball. The players are only half of what brings success to the softball team. Softball manager Caden Graham says he's been longing for this moment from a very young age. I was exposed to softball at an early age. Most of my life I was growing up watching my sister play and my dad coach on the field. I started taking softball really seriously when I joined my high school softball program. Those years of dedication now pay off as he brings attention to detail to the Carolina softball program. UNC outfielder Sanaa Thompson says Caden is a jack of all trades. Caden like feeds my knowledge of the sport, you know, it's nice to have an outside perspective before my at-bats. He's very intentional with pitches, pitch calling, and like knowledge of the pitcher of the other team. He prepares me well. Whether it's organizing practices, analyzing game footage, or providing real-time coaching support, Graham has become an integral part of the team's strategy. I found out quickly that pitchers can dominate the game. So I would watch elite pitchers and learn their mechanics and try to replicate them myself when I would pitch and film myself as well. The Anderson Softball Stadium is in full swing as the team is gearing up for their first game early next year. The bases might not be loaded yet, but Graham says it will all be worth it. I'm for this upcoming season here at UNC. I'm excited to learn new things each day and see the talent that we have be displayed in our games. The players are not the only ones putting in the work. It's their hidden weapon, not always on the field, but right beside it. I'm Corey Davis, reporting. Fans hope his influence pays off tomorrow, as we all want to get that sour taste out of our mouths. The women's tennis team has been in carry this week, competing in the ITA All-American Championship. Sophomores Tatum Evans and Thea Rabman advanced to round 16 of the women's singles main draw after winning their matches on Thursday. The team will continue playing through the bracket into the weekend. The Tar Heel men's tennis team heads into this weekend looking to seal the deal at the ITA All-American Championships. Anthony Wright performed well through the tournament, matching up with opponents from LSU and Oklahoma and continuing his winning streak. Falling to Arizona on Wednesday, Wright will move to the consolation draw. Konstantinos Jokoris has also performed well, winning matches against Miami and Virginia Tech and defeating LSU in two straight sets. It's time for conference play. UNC Volleyball will face Syracuse tonight at home. UNC enters conference play 8-1 while Syracuse will enter the match undefeated. The Heels are 5-0 at home and will rely offensively on outside hitter Mabry Shaftmaster, who leads the team with 126 kills, and outside hitters Safi Hampton and Amani Foster. Syracuse will bring outside hitters Ava Palm and Skylar George to the net. UNC has won four of the past five matchups, and with Syracuse ranking last at 18th in the ACC preseason rankings, UNC could be starting conference play with a win. Women's golf traveled to Virginia for the Cavalier Regional Preview. UNC's Inez Ng brought home her first medal as a Tar Heel, and it was the individual title, winning by eight strokes. The team won the overall championship by 18 shots, one of many records set by the team so far this season. Even though the game itself was horrible, this football play of the week winner was not. During the second half of the game, the Heels brought back the heat by completing a scoop and score off of a JMU punt. The punt was blocked by linebacker Caleb Lavalli, leaving D-back Caleb Cost open to take it to the house. We'll be back to our regular schedule on Monday with two more Play of the Week candidates. Make sure to check out our Instagram to vote for your favorite. 
Club teams are often seen as a way to continue to play at a competitive level with less stress, but that doesn't mean there aren't troubles behind the scenes. Jesse Carrico dives into the UNC flag football team's probation. The UNC flag football team has seen success in the past, coming second overall in 2020 at the NC State Championship and winning the High Point Viking Belt Championship in 2023, but only a year on and they're struggling with probation. Club flag football team is on probation right now because the previous set of officers didn't complete all of the required paperwork, paperwork and other uh, things required by the sports club offices and it prevents us from getting really like any funding at all. It also prevents the team from playing in the indoor practice facility in the Eddie Smith Fieldhouse behind me. Instead, they train here on Hooker Field 4. Since we're a smaller club, it makes it even harder to sort of get back into things going. We have to complete all of the necessary requirements from the sports classes for each year, which would be this year. And we have to have like a meeting halfway through a semester with the sports club administration. Despite their probation, the flag football team remains hopeful for their upcoming season. We have a very positive outlook. So with these new people coming, we have a lot of talent coming in and we have a wide range of talent. So we have people who have talent and maybe not the football knowledge. So I'm bringing it up in that aspect. Go! <laughs> Get out of my oh, man. Go We're basically trying to rebuild the program because we had, at the end of the year last year, very few members were actually showing up. And we're hoping that next year, which I'll, I'll be gone by then, but hopefully next year and the years afterwards, the club will be a lot bigger. The club flag football team still don't know when their first game will be, but they're planning to play in a tournament at NC State in early October. I'm Jesse Carrico reporting. Speaking of flag football, the Daily Tar Heel and Duke Chronicle faced off on a game in Keenan Stadium last night. The Daily Tar Heel took the win, obviously. I heard about that. And you know, if our football players can play anything like our journalists, this weekend will definitely be a good one. That will do it for this edition of Sports Extra. We'll be back on Monday with all the highlights from another exciting weekend in Carolina Athletics.